This evening we're going to begin in the book of John, chapter 7, verse 24. We're asking that all believers would be noted for judging righteously. Our prayers this night have a theme of, of judging. Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. There, the Bible class this morning had to do with being able to make righteous judgments. The, the people of God are called to, we've been given the mind of Christ. So it's, it, it's part of our calling to be able to make righteous judgment. Uh, we serve him not only with our bodies and our souls, but with our minds. This has to do with having a heart for what's right and also an understanding between, you know, the priests of old, they were given so that they could, they could uh, teach the people between clean and unclean and between holy and profane. Profane not necessarily meaning sinful, but what is not sanctified unto the Lord and what is, you know. Uh, that these are, these are things that were always the purpose of God in creating man in his image so that these things could be manifested in us also and that we could have fellowship and communion with him in this area. There's no part of us that is not affected by the salvation which Christ has accomplished. This, is, this involves our affection, our determinations, our, the way we think, what we're able to receive of God. We have to be able to see God to understand what righteous judgment is. Otherwise, we'd be as we were before we ever come to Christ, being ignorant in matters. This is in small matters and in large matters. Everything doesn't come to us in a big giant package with a magnifying glass. We have to make multiple, multiple judgments throughout the day and continually be discerning and, and choosing what is righteous Remember, one of, the, one of the things that approved Christ was that he loved righteousness and hated iniquity and that the scepter of righteousness was the scepter of his kingdom. Yeah. Amen. So who would like to lead us in this? That all believers would be noted for judging righteously. Brother Jeremy. Sister Laura. All right. We're going to be turning to 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 5 for the next request, which is that all saints everywhere would not judge their own condition prematurely. It says, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts, and then shall every man have praise of God. There, we're not, we're not ever going to sit down on this side of of eternity, so to speak. There's, uh, we're never going to be able to be off our guard. We're never going to be able to just set aside uh, this this matter of judging our own selves. Again. Uh, this has to do with always being vigilant, choosing what is right, disdaining and discarding the things that are not right or that are less desirable, always choosing what is the, the better. You, you very rarely get into a situation where you have no option but one. It's not like we're being driven to heaven in a chute. And you just, yeah. here it is, and you're, you're just all boarded up on both sides with something driving you behind. And so there's no, no way to, to be wayward. We're constantly making uh, micro adjustments as well as macro adjust, adjustments in what we will do and what we will involve ourselves in, what, what we will, and we do choose. God has given us that to be able to do. The choices we have are the ones God gives us to make. But we, uh, we want to ask that, that saints everywhere would not judge their own condition prematurely. 
You can't sit back and say, okay, I'm pretty much made the right decisions up to this point, so this is a shoe in So, uh, you know, I've got a good momentum. I'm just going to coast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the wrong decision right there. Yeah. You've, you've, made a wrong, you've made a wrong turn right there because you really don't have the control in coasting that you do whenever you're applying power to something. Mm -hmm. So you've, you've already put yourself at a disadvantage and you've put yourself off your guard. Your enemy hasn't been unaware of any time we make those kind of decisions. I thought about that once. How does, how does the enemy know so much? Well, he has a history of the human race. He was, he was around when we were created. He knew what it took to make us fall. He, I don't think, it, well, I don't think, I know he doesn't have like access to our thoughts the way God does. But he is a very astute observer of humanity. Something, I mean, there are people who can do this. There are people who are trained to observe other people, whether you lift an eyebrow, whether you blink, whether you cock your head a certain way, that, that betray what's going on in your mind, whether you're really interested, whether you're just, you know, pretending, whether you're lying, whether you're probably telling the truth. People can do this to one another. Mm -hmm. It's like a science. Do you think the spirits can't do this? Yeah. That they can't observe you and tell when they've, they've kind of hooked your interest? Yeah, yeah. Or when you've lingered too long on yeah. something? Right. Or when you put it down immediately? Mm -hmm. they, that they're not privy to what you did and then what you're telling people you did? Yeah. Uh -huh. You know, they... There, we're up against a very, uh, when I say wise, it's a sensual, devilish, earthly wisdom, but it is a wisdom that is greater than our own. Mm -hmm. And so we, we cannot afford at any point to be off our guard. That's not saying we're trying to fool the devil. No, we have to be what we profess we are mm -hmm. and what God is making us in Christ Jesus to be the real thing and not an imposter. So we're asking that the saints would not judge their condition prematurely because this is a continual, constant, perpetual condition until when God has said, you're safe. Mm -hmm. No more. You can lay your armor aside now. But until we get that command, we're always in that stance because the enemy is never far from us. God's never far from us either. So it's not like we're, we're afraid and fearful, but, but we're not foolish. Yeah. So this is part of fighting the good fight of faith and, and putting yourself in a place where you're not easily overthrown by your enemy, not being one of those who would be an easy prey for the one who's walking about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may dis devour. You don't want to be putting a sign on yourself, you know, here I am, get me. So who'll lead us in that? That all saints everywhere would not judge their own condition prematurely. We are being saved. Brother Aaron, Brother Robert, Brother Judah. All right. And then finally, 2 Corinthians Chapter 5 and verse 14, where it is written, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And our prayer is that we would all have the proper judgment concerning Christ's death. That's a, that's a very powerful argument, and I would say that that probably... Um, very, it, well, it has escaped most men. Most men probably wouldn't know what that was talking about. All were dead. We thus judge that if Christ died for all, then we're all dead. Well, that means we all need Christ. He is our life. We are dead. Our lives are hid with Christ in God. There is no life outside of his. There's existence outside because he's given us that. But it isn't an existence which God recognizes uh, as far as being joined to himself. It can't really 
partake of him, can't understand him, can't have the things we prayed for earlier, cannot know the mind of God or think after the thoughts of God. It's enmity and alienation. That we would have a proper judgment concerning Christ's death. This is part of seeing ourselves in a right manner. This is part of the judgment that is going to support. It's a foundational judgment that is going to support and upon which we build our understanding of salvation, who we are, what we need, who can provide it, what the end is. All of those things are based on the death of Christ Jesus. We know that the, that the, the destruction of the world has been determined because of sin. This required, it could not have been done another way. Yeah. It could not have been done another way. We have to judge this rightly for, for us to be able to understand and to see the glories of what God has accomplished in Christ. If, if we can't judge this, then we can't really see what the, what the death of Christ has accomplished. The, the magnitude the magnitude, think of it, the Son of God died. Now, you, that's a lot to reason on. He didn't die so that the sun wouldn't have to be destroyed. He didn't die so that the flowers could have blooms. He didn't die, you know, we could say a whole bunch of stuff he didn't die for. We, we have to be able to judge this rightly to understand what, why did he die and what was accomplished in that death. Amen. And it's big. It's bigger than we can sit on a log and think up of ourselves. Yeah. Amen. You, you're going to have to. You're, this, this knowledge is going to be a basis of right reasoning as we read the scriptures so that our understanding can be opened up. And so that the glory of God can be manifested in us because we're making a right judgment concerning the death of God's Son. Christ was judged for us. That's a different kind of judgment. This judgment has to do with the reasoning and the, the seeing, the weighing of the import of that death and our lives because of that death. So who? That, that's a big that's, that is a big, and it's, it is very precious to the heart of God. It's really, it's really a wonderful thing that we could even pray for this prayer. Yeah. It's that precious. So who will lead us in that? That we would have proper judgment, proper judgment, God-honoring, God-directed, God-inspired judgment concerning Christ's death. Sister Laura. Brother Tony. Okay. All right, brethren. Thank you very much.